Sophie Germain was not originally known as Sophie Germain. She became familiar with Gauss um, through Gauss's book, um, fell in love with Gauss's math, and decided that she had to meet him, or at least pick his brain for a little bit. Now, this was not a day and age when women were to be so outspoken or included in the sciences, especially mathematics. And so she started corresponding with Gauss under the assumed name Monsieur Leblanc. It was only when uh, Gauss ran into a situation where he needed a little bit of money that she was forced to out herself as Sophie Germain. But Sophie is, is uh, very important when we come to talking about Fer uh, Fermat Sass theorem. Um, most, most summaries of the story or of the history of this particular problem will talk about her very specifically. She managed to divide Fermat Sass theorem into two cases. Uh, one where the numbers are uh, not divisible by five and one where the numbers are divisible by five. Um, her work towards um, n equals five is actually used um, pretty heavily by uh, Dirichlet and Legendre um, about 15, 20 years before she passes away. But her work for case one developed a foundation for how all primes less than 100 can be eliminated from the solution set for n. And, and it's going to be exploited by some others down the road. But for right now, it's important to note that she's the one who sets this, this huge foundation for, for losing quite a bit of prime numbers, uh, quite, quite a few prime numbers there. Uh, Joseph Fourier, I, I'm only going to mention tangentially, um, while he does work with periodic functions, he also developed a theorem regarding the position of roots of an algebraic equation. Um, but his work in transforming mathematical elements from one branch of math to another becomes very useful as we get into some of the work later on down the road, um, especially when we get into group theory. Uh, some of this transformation becomes a bit more important to us. Ernst Kummer, um, his work becomes the foundation for a gentleman by the name of um, Mazur. Mazur's work is the one that inspires uh, the work of Wiles, and Wiles is the one who ends up proving um, what we need to prove uh, for, for Fermat's last theorem. So Kummer is very important to us. He develops this idea of ideal numbers. Um, it wasn't useful for him necessarily to look at um, true and real numbers as, as we know them. What he wanted was a way to describe the numbers that would work in a particular uh, in a particular equation. And he's going to call that the ideal number. Now if he can find some way of, of putting a, n a label or a name to that ideal number, that would be a goal there. But this theory of ideal numbers is, is out of the blue. No one's thought of doing that before. Um, rather than looking for specific possible solutions, looking at what a general form of something like that would look like. Now he does build on Germain's work and proves Fermat's last theorem for the regular primes. Now that's a regular prime is related to Bernoulli numbers in ways that um, that I really don't know that much about, just to be honest with you. Um, but 37, 59, and 67 are the only irregular primes less than 100. So he actually takes those three cases apart and solves and proves for mass less theorem for those three cases. So by the time Coomer's, uh, you know, by the time Coomer's done the bulk of his work towards for mass less theorem, we've now proven that for all the integers between 3 and 100, for mass less theorem is true. There are no integer solutions to x to the n plus y to the n equals z to the n. We also get to a point uh, in the 1800s where two gentlemen, uh, independent of each other, have looked at Euclidean geometry and have wondered what would happen if we took away the parallel postulate. 
the idea that two lines that are parallel never cross. Independently now we have created both elliptical and hyperbolic geometries. Um, that particular type of geometry is going to be important to us again as we lay the foundation for Fermat's last theorem. Everest Galois deserves some specific mention. Galois, you'll notice by his uh, year of birth and year of death, that at a young age, um, his theories were well ahead of his time. Um, it, 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 the story goes that he was trying to uh, take his examinations to go to college, and he was describing the answers and more in ways that the instructors could not even begin to understand. And as a result, they failed him or denied him admission. And so he got very frustrated as he tried to go to college, couldn't get in, even though he's way too smart to even be in college. Um, tries that in a few different times, fails and fails and fails. Eventually gets uh, sucked into the um, a revolution in France. Um, at the end of that, he's accosted by um, a man of, of position and of social stature and is somehow challenged to a duel. Poor Galois has no idea how to fight a duel and is killed. But the night before he dies, uh, he actually writes down all of his theory and mails that, uh, to one of his close friends. But his theory hinges on this idea of, uh, of groups. What we're looking for are solutions to polynomial equations, uh, and that's somehow related to the structure of a group of permutations associated with the roots of that polynomial. Um, Galois theory, like I said, is, is beyond what anybody at the time is able to even begin to comprehend. Uh, he's young, so no one takes him all that seriously anyway, uh, and tragically he died uh, before he could really do some uh, some expansion of those ideas and put the word out in more traditional means. Abel uh, is about the same time working in Norway. Uh, he also developed a form of group theory independently from Galois. Uh, now, he also talks about groups that are uh, special in that the order of operations can be reversed without really affecting the outcome. And you'll notice that the name of that group is Abelian group or Abelian group. It is named very specifically after this man. Um, he was born into poverty and worked hard, actually graduated from college but still couldn't find a teaching position at any university. And had really had no way to support his family so he's working in horrible conditions and um, and again he's living in Norway so it's cold um, he uh, he takes a trip to meet his or to meet with his fiance over, over Christmas uh, and just a couple months later uh, he is dead of tuberculosis just a few days after he dies the letter arrives that says he's been given a professorship uh, in Germany. So tragically it came just a little too late. So Abel and, and Galois never really got a chance to fully develop and fully interact with the mathematical community uh, regarding their ideas. Richard Dedekind on the other hand does. He, during his life he edited the collected works of uh, Dedeklet, uh, who we talked about uh, solving for uh, n equals 5. Uh, he edited complete works of Gauss and of Riemann. And so he, he's got his hands deeply into uh, the math of the day. Uh, he's working on the ideas of Coomer. He's expanding on that. He's uh, the first person to actually teach Galois theory. So he's not only taken it uh, to mind and heart, studied it, but has recognized there's a lot of worth in this. And so uh, pushes that out there to the rest of the mathematical community. He defined ideals um, as a subset of a set of numbers composed of algebraic integers that satisfy polynomial equations with integer coefficients. That should sound a lot like Diophantus' description of his equations. So Coomer's ideals are really a subset of solutions to Diophantine equations. 
Henri Poincaré, Poincaré uh, is a Frenchman. Um, he is recognized as one of the uh, of a handful of the brightest mathematicians ever to have lived, um, along with Gauss. Um, Poincaré is said to have been a master of all of the mathematical uh, fields that were available at that time. Um, he was involved with number theory, abelian functions, hyperbolic geometry. So we start hearing some of those other mathematicians we've seen. Um, topology, which was actually started by Euler, but Poincaré took it in some significantly different directions. Start talking about periodic forms and modular forms, uh, which we mentioned with Fourier. Uh, we're dealing with those in the complex plane, which we talked about with Gauss and Euler. Um, we're looking at automorph morphic forms. Uh, it's something that I think Poincaré uh, developed independently and uh, actually started that particular branch. We're looking at non-Euclidean spaces, so again, uh, those non-Euclidean geometries that Bolyai and Lovacheski uh, developed, uh, those are all well within his, uh, his scope of influence in the mathematical world. The idea that all those things are now starting to come together is important as we move forward with the story of uh, Fermat's last theorem. Leo Mordell um, comes along and he is very heavily involved in number theory and Diophantine equations as well. Um, in addition to linking some of the other fields, algebra and topology being among them, Mordell has this idea, and we're going to call it a conjecture because it's not a proven uh, idea. It's just one that he's one that he's made a statement that he's made. He suggests that Fermat's last theorem had, if any, only a finite number of integer solutions. Um, now, this is based on uh, the way that we classify elliptic curves. There's something called a genus that we attach to it um, based on its features, based on its powers. Um, and any elliptic curve that has a genus greater than one should have only finitely many rational points. Now, as we increase the index of the exponent on Fermat's last theorem, the genus continues to increase. And so we do have a restricted number of rational points. So if any integers exist, they would be few and far between. Well, in the 1970s and 1980s, Gerd Faltings uh, is doing his work in mathematics, and he actually proved Mordell's conjecture. So, uh, Granville and Heath Brown take, take Faltings' work and go a step further and say that if there are any solutions at all for Fermat's last theorem, that the number of those solutions actually decreases as n increases. So as our exponent gets larger, we should have fewer and fewer possible solutions if they even exist. Amir Axel uh, is one of, uh, one of a number of authors who have written about Fermat's last theorem and the history of it. And he suggests that by the time Faltings puts that statement out, Fermat's last theorem is almost always true. And as it turns out, by the early 1980s, now we've proven that there are no solutions for any exponent lower than one million. Uh, so we've, we've really done some, some work on this problem, but we haven't completely proven it.